the review going. So this is exam one review. This is covering chapters 26 through 35, and it is a lot of information. So we make these reviews for you to go over, see those key concepts. When you don't understand them, you can either go back to the book, or if you're one of my students, go back to a cahoots and see what that concept said there. And um, all of your professors do get all my cahoots. So if you want them to look at, to review, because they're a great, basically mini exam before your exam. And they're quiz questions that I actually just make up um, with uh, concepts. So um, they're there for you to use. So we're gonna go over the PowerPoint tonight. And um, remember, if there's anything you all aren't understanding, um, please, please let me know what you need because I'm sure if you have a question, I'm sure somebody else has a question too. Professor um, Bogart? Yes. Do you share those um, cahoots with uh, Professor Morris and do we just need to ask her to put them up? I ask her for it and if you're having issues, what I'm going to do is when I send them the link to my YouTube channel for this review, I'm also going to send weeks one, two, and three cahoots with it. So you should get the whole thing. If okay. in case you don't, you can always ask me. I will send it to you, okay? okay. Thank you, Professor Bogart. No, not a problem at all. It's a good question, you know, so you understand where the information is so you can help yourself. So that's a good thing. So. We gave you a handout, you know, in the first week regarding theorists. And we've been talking a lot about theorists and, you know, how do they relate to children and what does those words mean? And, you know, as we've been going through the weeks, we've been going over them. Now, the first part of Erickson is trust versus mistrust. Now, what I want you to know is not just what it says, trust versus mistrust. All right, those are words. But what does it mean? As an infant, if you trust, you know when you cry, you know that mommy's gonna get you to change you, to feed you, to burp you, you know, and your needs will be met. And mistrust is those infants are not getting all the attention they do need. When it goes forward, it goes into that toddler stage, that autonomy versus shame and doubt. And that's about being able to do things for themselves, the attempt you know, to potty train, right? That's that time or to try to get dressed and, you know, let it, parents let you do it. And that doubt is when the parents don't let you try something. So now you're doubting your abilities. Can I do that? So when you're looking at these stages, just don't look at words, okay? Oh, the other two that are very important that you see um, all the time is industry versus inferiority. This is school-age children. What does industry mean? Well, industry is those tasks that a child can do and do well, whether it's math, whether it's sports, whether it's baking, cooking, spelling, whatever it is, that's that child, that school-age child does it well. And then inferiority is those things they can't. Now you have children who are smart, but they're not athletics, so they can't kick the ball. Or maybe that they're really good at baking and music, but they're not really good in spelling. You know, it depends. That inferiority is what they don't do well, and industry is those tasks they do well. And the next stage we see a lot of references to is identity versus confusion. So I call it identity. This is adolescence. This is who am I? What am I going to be? Where am I going in life? You know, sexually, who am I? Um, and then what peer group do I fit into? Um, and then the identity is they really have a hard time with self-image. They believe their body image isn't what it should be and they always want it to be better. So understanding what these means is what you have to do, not just understanding words. Now Freud talks 
oral, anal, phallic, you know, it's all sexual genital. I think the stage that we focus more on with Freud is that early age, that infant age, that sucking, chewing, biting, that they get satisfaction from all of that. And we know, for instance, that the pacifier, the non-nutritive sucking device, you know, um, also a pacifier, you put it in an infant's mouth and it's a self-soother. They can relieve their own stress. It's very similar to the sensory or motor of Piaget. But remember, Piaget talks a little more. It's just not the mouth, it's the touch, it's the texture, and then being able to move it and make sense of it. More cognitive thinking. Freud is more all about that oral sucking. Now, Kohlberg. When you think of Kohlberg, think of morals. You know, you think about good and bad behavior. Well, what Kohlberg says to those younger children is that if you do good, there's a consequence. But if you do bad, there's a consequence. So there's a consequence for either or. And they know how to get praised. And they know when they do something wrong, there's going to be something that's going to happen from it. And that's basically what Kohlberg's talking about. As we get older, into the later of the school age, it comes more being able to be what you need to be in a situation, that conformity. You know, I go to school, I know I have to be in my class on time, I have to have my homework done, you know, and that's what you do. And, you know, become more loyal, loyal to your friends, which usually this age is your same sex peers in your school age. Post-conventional is, and you get older, being able to fit into society. You know, you're not trying to change it. You know what you need to, need to do to be a part of it. And this is just, you know, uh, Laszlo's, um, Maslow's uh, hierarchy. And it just talks about how this Kohlberg builds upon just simple, simply right and wrong, and then get to the point where you're able to function as an adult and be a part of the, um, in the community. Now, play is so important in children. This is what um, sparks that magical thinking and being able to say as an infant, to say, you know, I had a voluntary, you know, a reflex grasp. Now I can grab my rattle. And then I found if I shake it, I can hear it, you know? And this is part of cognitive awareness and it's their own little sort of play. But when they describe play, it's usually older children, usually uh, as we get to toddlers. And then there's a child who just looks, that onlooker. You know, they see something there and they're watching. Solitary play, I mean, a lot of times we talk about solitary play. And this, a lot of times, is your autistic child. They play alone by themselves. There's many children who like to do their own houses and their own buildings and their own dolls and by themselves. Then there's parallel play where you're playing with the same things, um, but you're not involved with each other. Associative companion play. This is a little different from cooperative. These are two children or more playing together, but associative play is they're sort of doing the same thing, but they're not creating something. There's not a goal in the end. It's not like they're building a house together. Um, cooperative play is there's a goal. That means we together as a group are going to go ahead and build a house together. And that's how we're doing it. Or we're playing a board game like checkers, um, whereas there is a winner in the end. So there's a goal. So cooperative is when they two children play together, there's a goal. Associative is playing together, but they're just playing together, having fun and making it up as they go. So play is important because of that imagination. It starts with muscle movement, that dexterity, you know, of course, cognitively putting two and two together. You know, it is part of that brain development that we really need. And of course, playing with other children is interacting with people around them, which is all great. Now in medicine, there's different sort of plays. I mean, we are lucky today. We have child life specialists. Uh, when they first came in, I was working in an emergency room, a trauma ER, level four. And I was a trauma nurse and a charge nurse, et cetera. And it, they came in and they started 
going into rooms and talking to children about procedures. And I was like, oh, well, okay. Um, where do these people come from? Because we weren't introduced by management who these people were. Well, I came to absolutely love this group. What they can do is through play, of course, going on their developmental levels because this is what they study, developmental levels and play appropriate for each um, level of those um, children's ages. Um, this is what they learn you know, through their four, six, eight years of um, college education. And what they do is they allow the child to relax, understand that who they are, and through um, play, toys, touching, feeling, they learn what needs to be done. And what's good about children, even one-year-old, you explain what's going to be coming up, then they're not afraid. They've touched it already, so they're not afraid. So they still feel in control of their environment. One of the things that we really didn't go over a lot in class is about we're gonna do a history and a physical and part of the history is allergies. But in children, we wanna know certain things about it. What was the reaction? Was it an intolerance? Was it a vomit? Was it a rash? Or it was, you know, choking, not breathing. There's a difference in reaction. Um, any other reaction to any else over the counter prescription in the past? How long was the medicine taken at that time? Was it the first dose or the last dose? Because it could be either. And it's as soon after taking the drug, when did a reaction happen? And how long ago is this? You know, the child could be a nine-year-old. This could happen when they were two. And um, at this point, you know, we find out, did you ever attempt to try that again? Because it was could it be six, seven years ago. Did a doctor say, let's try it again? Um, and then who told you? that this is a reaction and to be really careful. So, and making sure that telling medical people um, your history on allergies, that what reaction was had when you took these meds, the child took that medication. Cultural differences. Well, you know, there's so many cultures in the world and it's so diverse and you, know, you can't learn everything and know everything about every culture. So with cultures, how do we do a history and physical? Well, you have a child come in and you know it's a culture that you're not familiar with. Number one, as a nurse, you need to understand certain things about your patient, whether an adult or child. You need to know what's going on. What do they need? What are the differences? It could be that this child needs to be on a vegetarian diet. Some cultures are like that. Or there are cultures that a female cannot have a male nurse. These are things we need to know in order to plan care for the next shift, the next days. Um, it could be all male nurses on a shift and it does happen. So knowing this and being prepared, being very cognizant of the fact of protecting their you know, privacy. Um, there are cultures that don't like to take all the clothes off. So, how do we know these differences? You need to ask. You know, there are some cultures that need time to pray. There are some cultures that need to do different rituals. And as long as it doesn't interfere with medical care, these things are okay. Um, it is saying that you are different, different cultures, and you can do what you need to do, which will make you and your child feel better because you are, you know, taking care of your own culture, which for some cultures is very important. So assessing the child. Well, there's history, like I said, like allergies, and then there's physical findings. Physical are things that you can touch and hear. So it could be vital signs, of course, you're doing that, touching it yourself, height and weight, you're looking at that, and then you're listening to their body parts, their lungs, you know, looking in their ears, their eyes, their bellies, et cetera, pulses. That's all a physical finding. So growth at any age, you know the answer when you see children sitting with food. The most important thing in children is nutrition, 
nutrition, nutrition. The child's not getting proper nutrition. They're not going to grow properly and their cognition is not going to develop. And these children will be behind on that growth and development levels that you will see. So how do we measure nutrition? Well, if they're eating enough, they're growing enough, right? So one of the ways is by looking at their weight. An infant should double their birth weight at six months. They're born at seven pounds. They should be weighing about 14 pounds at six months. And then at one year old, 12 months, they should have tripled their weight. <laughs> that seven pound <laughs> infant is going to be 21 pounds at one year. And then the other things we can look at is developmental levels. Are they turning over? Are they walking? Are they crawling? All of those things, the grass, the fine motors, are they able to grasp? Are they now voluntary? And are they switching hands? All of these things can be looking at nutrition, cognition, and of course, the weight. So frequent assessments that we do in children. So when we get a child into whether it's a doctor's office or into some sort of emergency or urgent care, we are going to be doing number one, that physical assessment, which looks at height and weight. That's all in everyone and vital signs. Then as we're looking at the children, we're doing these developmental assessments. Is this kid six months old? Is he able to turn over? Is this kid eight months old? Is, are they able to sit by themselves unsupported? And if they're not, are they at least moving in that direction? At least they should be able to roll over, you know, by eight months. So as long as they're going forward and moving, you know, up the sequences of developmental um, status, these children are doing okay. But let's say six months old, they are barely lifting their head up. Something's wrong. If you take their hands and pick them up and their head legs to the back, which means the head's no control. It's not holding itself up like it should. What do we do? That's when we tell the physician and we institute early intervention. That's speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and it really helps bring most children back where they should be. So when you assess the uh, abdomen, the first thing you do is just look at it. Just look, is it round? Is it distended? Is it loopy? Do you see abdominal breathing? What do you see? You know, the other thing is, what is the color of this child? Is the child pink or are they pale? Are they yellow? What do they look like? We also can see, you know, is there an umbilical hernia or even, you know, inguinal hernias? We can see those things just by looking. Then we auscultate and we start left upper and work around to um, the right lower and get all of the different quadrants. We take our time um, doing that. You know, just by listening to abdomens, I've actually found Wilms tumors just by doing a, an assessment with my stethoscope. And I didn't have to do anything, percussion or palpation because my stethoscope I put down, I felt this big lump. I said, I believe I know what's going on here. Now, let's say you hear all breath sound, all bowel sounds are there. Then you're gonna do some percussion. Percussion can tell you if there's masses or fluid in there. You can feel the squishing of fluid. You actually can just by percussing. And of course, palpating in there. Is the liver down low? Is it where it should be? You know, is there tenderness? All these things are important. You also need to know where your heart valves are, okay? So there is in the book, you can look at it, but we've also put it here in, you know, a picture. You have the aortic, the pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral. These are things that are important for a pediatric assessment. And then this is the location in words. So the aortic is the second intercoastal space, right side. Pulmonic is the second intercoastal space, but the left of that sternal border. And then mitral valve is that lower one, fifth intercostal space, midclavicular, and then tricuspid is the fifth right and left intercostal space right there. So your tables in the book, I would review that, look at that, 
and understand it because we need to if we have a child who's cardiac and we're going to get that on week five you know where do we listen to listen for the valves and are they functioning correctly another thing we do a lot because children have a lot of upper respiratory infections they have these little short little eustachian tubes and they're straight huge adenoids, huge tonsils, and we have to figure out, are we listening to upper airway sounds or is this sounds coming from the lungs? So many times we'll just do tracheal, bronchial breath sounds, these sounds, because we're seeing, is it upper airway? And then of course, when we look to the vesicular, then we're looking at the air that's moving in the, the lungs, but is it upper or lower? Because a lot of those children, mucus in the back and it sits in the throat and that's what you're here. And that's, you know, part of the coughing because of all of the dripping. So these are where you hear your breath sounds. Bronchial is over the trachea by the suprasternal notch. The bronchial vesicular, now this is the trachea and the bronchia um, bifurcate. And this is now listening to a little bit of both, but the vesicular is all your lungs. And then this advantageous just means sometimes you can put a stethoscope on the abdomen. It's almost like referred sounds. It is so loud sometimes these upper airway noises or sometimes a really bad congestive failure. You can hear it anywhere over the chest, even on the abdomen. So car seats, you know, I remember that car seat up there that looks like a little milk crate. Uh, I think I was put in one of those as a kid. Um, they've changed so much. And I know that when my children were born, which are now, um, let me see, 39 years ago, that these car seats were just started to be recommended for children coming home from the hospital. You couldn't take your baby home unless you had a car seat. The funny part, it was front facing, it wasn't rear facing. So you can see how much evolution that car seats have gone through. Now, car seats is important that a car seat that's put in there, it is something that will um, help your children. It's not expired, it hasn't been in an accident. Very important. So. Car seats do expire between six and 10 years from date of manufacture. And that car seats shouldn't just be picked up from a garage sale. It could be, you know, your friend's extra car seat she had in her, you know, let's say in her husband's car, but they never used it. You know, that you knew it was, you know, not that old, but car seats, very important to put your child in a proper one. A lot of pediatric facilities, hospitals have these car seat Saturdays, we used to call them at, at Nicholas Children's where I worked. Vaccines for um, sexually transmitted um, diseases and preventative and, you know, immunizations are huge in uh, children, trying to get them so they're not going to catch any bad diseases. But Hep B is given at birth. Usually uh, it's right after 12 hours, usually before they go home. Some children, for whatever reason, will get it at the first doctor's visit, but it's usually said it's given at the hospital before they go home. Now, HPV vaccine, we can give to prevent, you know, this um, cervical cancer, you know, because of the HPV virus. And um, it's, we can start giving it at age nine, but usually they say 13 through 26, it's two injections, six months apart. And they're also now giving it to males also uh, because they can get you know, HPV also. So your infant, zero to 12. <clears throat> These are some developmental things that um, you should be aware of. So head lag is when you pull them up by the arms and their head legs back. So that means there's no head control. Now, this is normal at birth and maybe for the first two months of life. But when you get to be three, four, five, six months, they should be able to have their head pulled up as they get up. They should be able to sit as long as their back supported. Could be in a walker, you know, one of those little carriers, whatever. They can sit and they'll enjoy that. 
front to back, back to front, you know, is between five and six months. Um, but they should roll over completely by six months old. That means be careful of these children on a couch or on a changing table. When they are on their back, they put their hands, their feet, everything in their mouth. Remember, all oral, what do they do? They explore the world through their mouths, everything in their mouths. And this goes on through their toddlers too. They can, first, they're gonna have that reflex palmer grasp, uh, which they think, you know, mommy got the, the finger hugged and isn't that sweet? Yes, it is. But then they go and they can grab, let's say the rattle by themselves. That's about three months old. About seven months, they can put hand to hand with those. And they say about six months old, you should start to see teeth. And we just need to clean them with a warm, a wet, um, toothbrush, no fluoride or anything yet, just to keep the sugar from the formula or breast uh, when they go to bed. Colic is a very difficult thing for an infant to have for the infant, but for also the family. They are crying, crying, crying. Um, they're not hungry. They don't need change. They, you know, it's not they don't feel well. It's just their tummy hurts and they're crying and crying. Usually um, these children you will see by three, four months, it does go away, most of them. But can you imagine three or four months of a baby crying over eight hours a day in the poor parents trying to rest? These parents get exhausted and I can understand them being exhausted trying to get help. It doesn't matter, breastfed, bottle fed. If your baby's gonna have colic, they're gonna have colic. And one of the things about colic and understanding babies go through that, as nurses, if you get a phone call from a parent who says you have a young infant, six weeks, eight weeks old, young, who's crying like more than eight hours a day, don't just say it's colic. That child needs to be assessed by a physician. Those children need to come into the office to make sure it is colic because there's other things that these children could have, which could be life-threatening. So developmental periods, we call them different. Sequential trends, developmental pace, sensitive period. So sequential means that you know that the kid is going to lift their head up, roll front to back, back to front, up and they're gonna crawl and they're going to crawl before they creep, they creep before they walk and they walk before they run. This is all part of a sequence of things that are gonna happen. It's predictable. We know these things are gonna happen and all children, all different ages, you can't predict when it will happen, but as long as they're going forward, you're doing good. Developmental pace just means that there's when children go and they start doing these things, the, the creeping and the walking, all ch children do things differently on a different um, time period. And there are children who may never crawl. They may go right to standing up from, you know, laying on their backs. And it's okay. You can skip that stage. And there are sensitive periods where they just do things in leaps and bounds and really quick. It, it's just, what they all of a sudden get this um, incredible knowledge and they know how to do everything. And then it slows back down again. And that's sensitive. Fontanelles, we have anterior and we have a posterior. And understanding when they close is important. If we have an infant whose fontanelle hasn't closed, a posterior by six to eight weeks, we have to ask, well, the kid's now five months old, why is it still open? Is there swelling going on in the brain? Is there hydrocephalus? Something could be happening. So it's important to know six to eight weeks posterior. Anterior is 12 to 18 months, it closes too early. We're not allowing the brain to grow, it closes too late again. Why is it happening? So we need to remember those things. Another thing, children are born with two eyes that don't work together. So you have one eye looking over here and one eye looking over there. And that's what you call binocularity. That means they're not working together yet, but 
by four months, all of a sudden, they start to work together. And that's when the depth perception starts. That's when they're starting to reach for their uh, rattle at that point. That's what binocularity means. Eyes going in different directions and at four months, they're coming together. Now I can reach things because now I'm understanding. Their vision, you know, is getting a lot better at birth. They black and white mobiles, they say, are just good. They're not really into color yet. And they're seeing hazes and not much. But by 12 months old, they're pretty good with what they're able to see. Pain in infants, one of the most undertreated things that I'm telling you is one of my pet peeves. You know, infants do hurt and they should be medicated as needed. When you see an infant crying, grimacing, that little chin just quivering and the tears coming down and the eyes are so tight and you see their legs up and down and you can hear them, this child hurts. This child really hurts. So this child, it may be as simple as, you know, picking them up and burping them, but they might need some real medicines depending on their conditions. <coughs> okay, SIDS. Sudden infant death syndrome. So infants should be placed to sleep and nap on their backs. They found that there's a decreased amount of sudden infant death when the babies were on their back. So infants who are on their tummy or on their sides will have an increased SIDS factor. Any loose items, blankets, pillows, um, bumper pads, uh, stuffed animals, all those things can smush a baby and cause them to uh, smother and to die. I've seen adults roll over onto their children um, at sleep. It was a larger person who slept, went over and actually rolled on the baby and the, the baby did suffocate and died. It was a, a very horrible thing to watch. Having a baby too hot, too many blankets, too many clothes, uh, smoking, of course, secondhand, prenatal care when there's not a lot. One of the things that um, we forget is what if they just were sick recently? They probably have some mucus left in there. So a recent viral illness, maternal age when they're younger, uh, premature babies, low birth weight, males are more than females. And formula fed babies are higher risk than your breastfed. Breastfed babies have a decreased chance of SIDS. Difference in reflex in infants, you know, we can measure and look at their central nervous system and see are they, you know, uh, assessing if they're going in the right direction. So the tonic nonic is when your neck's moving, grasp, we have your uh, reflux, then we have reflex, and then we have your voluntary, then it goes to that little pincer grasp, right? That's you pick them up and they always will try to walk and put them on their belly. They're gonna try to rock, they're gonna try to move. The other ones are the rooting, where you touch their chin, where they're trying to feed, uh, whether breast or bottle. Um, sucking, you put something in their mouth, they suck. The moral or startle, and you can see this baby here, just the, hand, the hands play and the feet come up too. Uh, it could be loud noises, a bump into their um, crib and you'll see them move. And this Babinski is just like the adults, it's the bottoms of their feet. Another reflex they have is newborns that are born, okay? Um, don't have a parachute reflex, which means they're about to fall. It's like the cat who puts their hands and their feet out. Children actually do this. And if it starts about six to nine months, which is actually good because this is when the children are rolling. And this is uh, when the child has more of a chance of falling out or off of uh, their changing tables or their or couch or whatnot, because um, they have this reflex, they can put their hands out now. So it does help. But remember, when you put your hands out and you fall, it does allow for fractured wrists, you know, and it doesn't mean that their arms are strong enough to prevent their head from um, getting contused also. 
So gross motor development. This is anything about getting up and go. This is all about movement. Gross means movement. Get up and go, 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 as Paw Patrol says. So that's head up, head and chest, sits up, tummy to back, back to tummy. All of these movements are all part of motor and they go in the sequence. Again, it doesn't mean that a sequence may not be um, skipped as long as they're going down the list. Toddlers, ages one to three, when you're approaching a child who's a toddler, number one, don't approach and touch them immediately. You need to first give them uh, something about you that doesn't frighten them. As in, you walk in, you say, oh, look at the cute little Superman shirt you got. Or just talking to them first, you know, and then start playing with them. And then you go in and show them the equipment, show them what you're doing, and then the infant will work with you. Always keep the parents in there and let them hold their infant, their toddler. This actually decreases the stress before you even walk in the room. And then it helps them keep their stress levels down because now you've built up a rapport. Now they're playing with you, but they're still in mommy's arms. So toddlers, you play with. And they love to play about their ears and their nose. And, you know, all of those things do help these um, to um, toddlers not be so threatened. Pain in the toddler. You know, I think toddlers, when they don't hurt, they sit down. They're great. And they're not going to tell you when they don't hurt. So what would you see? Well, I think the number one thing I see with a toddler in pain is they're not going to play. They're going to sit there and they're just going to put their head down. Very unusual. Toddler is like, you know, a blender with the lid off. They're everywhere. Okay. If they're not moving, they're not eating, they're crying, sort of moaning, something's wrong, you know, and sometimes it's just moving their head. You can see, you know, their head hurts for the younger ones. We use the flax scale on children all the way up through toddler. Preschoolers get the faces scale and that's forward. Okay. So faces has to do with what their face looks like. Their legs, are they moving? Are they, you know, their activity? Are they laying there? Are they running? They're crying. And this is a big one, especially in infants, consolability. Are you able to calm that child down? Are they able to be consoled? So diet and your infants. By age one, 12 months, the American Academy of Pediatrics says, you can introduce a whole milk into the diet, not the 2% whole milk into the diet, and you can replace formula or breast with it. And then preschoolers, ages three to four, you know, I, I think that this is where they start learning how to talk more. They're starting to understand things better. And here's Kohlberg again. So we know that your toddlers and preschoolers, and we talk about moral development, again, they know right and they know wrong and they know each one that there is a consequence for it. Another part of this morality is, is you know, I see mommy crying and they say, that's not normal, let me go hug mommy. They start to see other people when they're upset or hurt and they do want to comfort them. That's Colbert, moral. So preschool, this is the age of Band-Aids. This is, I am bleeding, put a Band-Aid on it, it cures everything. So my grandson, who's now five, knows where the Band-Aids in his house is, and he'll say, I need a Band-Aid, and he'll go get it, and we'll put on another Band-Aid. But they believe that if you do not cover bleeding, they're gonna bleed out, they're gonna to bleed to death. So this Band-Aid is a cure-all for all of that. 
pain scale, as I said, is now your faces scale. They're able to look at this and they're able to say, this means this big smile means you feel really great. And this one over here, sad is crying. They feel really bad. How do you feel? And they will tell you exactly how they feel. Children don't lie. They're so amazing. Preschoolers, gross motor skills. Get up and go, 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 right? Three-year-old can walk on a line, can get and balance on a stick of wood or a low balance beam. They can skip, they can gallop, they can walk backwards. They can pedal a bicycle, catch a ball, and jump with two feet. Jessica, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. You said the flax scale, the flax scale is between two years and seven years, and then the no flax flax goes up to toddler or nonverbal. Okay, because it says on the slide it's like children age two to seven, but then I mean, the you can use you you can use it. You can many children. That's what you have to, but you can at age um, preschoolers, when you get to those three, four, you can use as the faces and they'll show you the face. But flack you can use all the way through and you can use it for non-verbal children, like children with cerebral palsy. They can't talk to you, but you can see flack with them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. So gross motor. Um, ages four. This is the one when you can stand on their foot now and they think that's pretty neat because they couldn't before. Tippy toes, jumping, um, they can jump over hurdles and now they can run and um, they can go back and forth and all over. So as you can see, they become more and more agile. Fine motor skills. When you think fine motor, think F fingers things you do with your hands. So when you're talking fine motor skills, know that, um, for instance, this preschooler can button his shirt with fine motor. It may not be completely correct, but you know, do it. And then going and drawing within the circles becomes a big thing for preschoolers. So preschoolers are getting ready for kindergarten. You know, kindergarten is, you know, more um, structured, a little bit more time. Um, it requires a child to learn, to be involved, follow directions, uh, get along with other children. All of these things are important. So as we prepare a child for kindergarten, you know, what should we do? Well, number one, we should always, as parents to a kid going to kindergarten, be positive about, wow, you're going to school, you're going to learn more. I mean, reading to children is invaluable. Children learn from these books and learn words and get into preschool, kindergarten especially, and they are far advanced because they know more uh, these words and what they mean. It provides social and emotional growth because they have to be with other children. And remember, these children are feeling what other children do too. So if one doesn't feel well, they all feel bad for this kid most of them. Um, also, um, when you're getting into these older ages, preschool, going to kindergarten, we're also doing all of these activities, those gross and fine motor skills will be encouraged, whether it's going out, playing PE, you know, playing in the playgrounds, or, you know, fine motor skills, coloring, um, lettering, um, into the, making sure they color in the lines, all of these fine motors, you know, will be refined and refined. And a kid in kindergarten is now in full sentences, paragraphs, their language is getting better. They can articulate so much better. And school age. Well, school age is that age of uh, children um, who can become obese for many different reasons. Now, obesity in school age children is the most common nutritional problem with children. Um, and we should 
be teaching good nutrition to this child from, you know, as soon as we can. And we know proper nutrition is important. Now, what happens in school age is children are not getting out and going and running around and riding the bike and things. They're staying inside. They're playing uh, their video games. They're on their phones. They're watching television. And, you know, it's easier, you know, for children to do that. It, it could be because, you know, their outdoor environment is not safe. That could be something. You know, but what happens, school age children become obese. And then what happens is these obese children now are, um, pre, are pre skewers to a hypertension, a hypercholesterol, um, diabetes, you know, because of what we call cardiometabolic changes. So their bodies are changing because of the obese, um, too much weight on these children. It has no racial cultural barriers. It doesn't matter who you are. Any child could um, have the ability to be um, obese. And, you know, the thing with school age children, they're so willing to learn um, and making them understand about nutrition and what they should have should be a part of the school system to make sure that they're getting, you know, um, all about nutrition. In school age, um, especially as we get later on, same-sex peers and being accepted by them is important. This is why you'll have children playing different sports because their friends, their peers are in the other ones. And, and that's okay. Um, at this point, you know, they'll eventually do what they want to do as they get a little bit older. So having a child, school-age children, these are about ages 6 to 12, and it's a broad area, 6 to 12. So again, always communicate in a language that they'll understand. Now, you know, you could say, we're just going to send you for a chest x-ray and oh, you come right back. Well, what about this little six-year-old boy who's into spaceships and laser guns and stuff? He hears x-ray. He thinks of things coming out and fire and going through his chest and burning him up. And it could be that. So just saying it's this big machine, but it's a camera. And when it's done, I'm going to show you your insides. And I can show you your bone where I think you broke it. And then you make it fun. And now it's not fearful, but just say, you know, it's not going to hurt. They don't understand that information. Explain it that you just put your arm down. It's a picture of a camera. They don't touch you. It doesn't hurt. And then we'll look at your picture. A hypoglossal nerve, I mean, health assessments, we learned about doing different assessment techniques, but hypoglossal nerve, all you do is have the kids stick their tongue out. And you can have infants just like this little one here, probably about four months old there. You can do it and they love to imitate. So even infants, you can do it too. So lymph node tissues. Well, in an infant, you have, um, um, in children, you have lymph nodes. Now, if you're sick, they're gonna be swollen because the lymphatic system is part of your immune system, right? But a child, who is normal and healthy, they're not gonna be able to feel any lymph nodes at all for them. So a baby is born and it has mom's immune system, but we know it's going to take time and exposure to new you know, um, antigens and new viruses so that the body can build up their own system. So um, we know children, they get immunized, a lot in the very beginning, you know, and all the way through their childhood. And that's only to build up the immune system. And then as they're catching these upper respiratories, they're building it even more. Dental health. Now in your younger school age children, six year olds, they don't know how to floss yet. Okay. But we should promote good um, brushing their teeth before they go to bed. Flossing is later on in school age. They just don't have the ability to do it yet. And it should be soft bristles and it should be fluoride toothpaste. And then adolescence. 
leading cause of death in adolescence is, of course, car crashes, suicide, and homicides. You know, these children, it could be they're driving the car or they're in the car. And then, of course, they are, you know, taking chances, risky behaviors, and these things can occur here. And when we talk about adolescence, the big thing is all about body image. And many adolescents become extremely depressed. And that's why they commit suicide because they don't feel they're good enough or they're pretty enough or smart enough. And, you know, they um, commit suicide. So adolescence, the sense of identity. So identity, what does that mean? This is Erickson. Well, identity is trying to figure out who they are. So these adolescents can become extremely rebellious. So as parents with the child, they need to set limits and structures because what is this child doing, especially that age 15 to 17 group? They're fighting for their independence and they're fighting for control of their environment. They're not young enough, they're not old enough, they're just in that in between. And now they're trying to position for what I can get away with and what I can do. So they want independence, they want control of their environment, but are they gonna do what they need to do to be able to do that? Well, you know, who knows? Some, some adolescents are smarter than others. Talking to an adolescent about sex. Well, can you, number one? Well, of course we can. But what we need to do is to sit and let them express themselves and what they want to understand. And then you can be able to, as we're speaking to this child, you know, break open the, you know, break the ice because, you know, you're an adult, so you're all adults and we all don't understand children, of course. I mean, that's the last thing we could do is understand what an adolescent is. But if you're sitting there and talking to them and we ask them about what music do they like or if they're going to school, what subject, you know, are they in after school activities? You know, oh, I see you have really cool sneakers. You like sneakers, something. Talk to them and all of a sudden, then the adolescent is going to be able to talk to you. Now, we don't give our opinions. What we do is we give information in oral and written form. And when we do that, you know, um, the adolescent has proper information. They shouldn't be going to their peers because they're not going to have all of the correct information. And know that sometimes as nurses, parents can't speak to their children about sex and about all of those things around that. So who should they go to? Well, school nurse, probably the best. And if not that, another nurse that they come in contact through, you know, whether at their pediatrician or if they're getting treated in, you know, urgent or, or ER. So again, build their trust, gain their trust, talk about things and let them know that, you know, you're not there to get them in trouble, but you're just there to help them understand what they need to understand, you know. Um, now, the only time we need to um, tell a parent what these children said is if what the information they said is telling me that this this adolescent's gonna hurt themselves or others. So if they're not in danger, it's okay, all right? And the other thing is, you know, it, let's say you're at that physician's office and the doctor wants to talk or you need to talk to them regarding these, these issues about sex, having the parents leave the room, so important. And let the child talk, you know, let them, you know, say what they need to say. Many times they're gonna to try to shock you. Now, adolescents should get a lot of sleep. They should be sleeping like um, infants, but they don't, they can. And the reason why, well, they're talking to their boyfriend till two in the morning and their best friend, and they got a test tomorrow and a project due it at school. And then you were out late at school with a basketball game, you know, and there was a dance after. So you are not sleeping hardly at all. So adolescents, sleep deprivation is a part of it. We should be promoting, 
you know, getting that enough sleep, but it is difficulty because of their social, you know, things that they need to do and through school and of course, you know, with their friends. Stages of puberty, you know, read about Tanner, Girls, number one change is breast buds. So we see um, a young adolescent, age 12, 13, and we see breast buds coming. We know this is a child going through puberty. Maybe there's questions they need. A boy, the first thing that we are going to see is um, a testicular enlargement. That's number one, okay? It doesn't say it on this slide, but boys is testicular enlargement, girls are breast buds. So you're gonna have five basic dosage calculation problems on your exam. I wish you all the best. Now, I did do a dosage calculation video. It, from last semester, I will be sending all of your professors the three handouts with answers. I'll be sending you your the YouTube channel for the dosage calcs, about an hour. It's very simple. It's not on proportion analysis, ratio analysis. It tells you how to pick out what you're looking for. Okay, it makes it simple. So if you need help, um, you have it there. Also, it has what you need for MedSurge too. It has mics per kilo per minute how to pull it out and make that easy also. So I'll be sending all of those worksheets. I'll be sending the dosage calc and I'll be sending this video to your professors by tomorrow about 12 noon. Any questions? Thank you everybody. Whatever you whatever you went over right now, we're going to be able to see the recording again, right? Because I want to, you know, look over this whole lesson again. I mean, you've done a great You'll job. Get it's a lot. <laughs> all of the recordings to all of the professors, um, and we post them on your announcements. Thank you so much. Thank you so so much. Now you could also go to Professor Bogart Pediatric Nursing, and you're going to see every week's professor. Um, all of my week's lectures there. So I have three classes a week. There's three classes every week that I post on that YouTube video channel. So there's sort, all sorts of researches for you. So just use them, use them can, and you'll do well. Can you please um, you know, text it to the group meetings so I can copy it because I didn't catch it. And I definitely wanna watch your videos. What, what it is, is Professor Bogart's Pediatric Nursing. And it's in YouTube. It's public. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Professor. And I found your YouTube channel. I see the cahoots are like below the video. Yes, Thank and you. I put them there in the box. Absolutely good. Glad you saw Thank it. Thank you. My pleasure.